Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solace, and with me, as always, is my very, very talented friend who can school me on all things liquid all day long, the mixtress, DC Gina. Hi, Louise. Hi, lovely. How are you? Well, I'm playing with my time. Ha 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 ha. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. I mean, that's a good joke to make when you have time in your hand. Get it? Oh, I got the herb, in case hand. our listeners don't get it. <laughs> I've been home with my kids all day. It's fine. Another mom joke. <laughs> and I it's know. like I'm within the first out, 60 gonna, seconds gonna, of the episode. I'm going to 86 dad jokes in my life and just bring on mom jokes now. How are they different? Whittier. Oh, okay. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> All right. In classrooms everywhere, Pride Month is an excellent time, obviously, to talk to students about inequality and justice. And we all know that history is remembered by the way it was recorded. And our literature often reflects those recordings. Oh, yes. So it comes to no surprise, no surprise at all, that we what we've been taught, you know, may not have may have been through somebody else's slightly discolored, rose-colored glasses, if you will. I guess I'd be rose-discolored glasses. Um, (laughs) So to help us better understand our history and our literature and how it intersects with the LGBTQIA plus community, please welcome today's designated drinker. He's one of a generation of scholars who's opened up queer studies and spaces and is currently a professor of literature and culture at Georgetown University, the author of Latinx Literature Now, and Cultural Erotics in Cuban America. Please welcome Professor Ricardo Ortez to the show. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. I'm, welcome. I'm honored to be a designated drinker. Absolutely. You know, I feel smarter just because he's in the space with us. Gina, what about you? I mean, yeah. <laughs> By proxy? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, what did you do today? I'm like, professor from Georgetown on yeah. All right, that's it. I don't have to say anything else. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ricardo, or Professor Ortez, to keep it right, um, <laughs> school is please. We all need it. Um, like Gina and I both expressed, we're really happy to have you on the show, very honored to have you on the show. Um, and it's really exciting for us to have you as a guest to kick off Pride Month. So please tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself, if you will, please. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'll try to stick to the parts that are more relevant to Pride Month. Everything but, uh, you have is relevant. Okay, good. So <laughs> I think it, it, it bears saying that I was born in Cuba in 1961, uh, and that we left uh, in 1966, uh, my, with, that I left with my, my family. And rather than settling in Miami, like a lot of uh, Cubans who left the island in the 60s did, we went to Los Angeles. And so I grew up in LA, and I still consider myself a Californian, even though I've lived for now uh, almost 30 years on the East Coast. Um, and so my I could tell you a lot more about my Cuban and my Latinx story, my immigrant yeah. story. Um, but I can I can fold in the sort of the LGBTQ part pretty Absolutely. pretty quickly, right? Sure. So um, it, because I was born in this particular generation, I was uh, you know coming of age in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, and went through college and even started grad school, still a little nervous about coming out, still a little nervous about identifying as gay first and then queer later. Um, but I also you know, came up through my education as a really avid reader, as a lover of stories and eventually a lover of literature. Um, I majored in English both in college and then uh, you wow. know, got my, my PhD in English in grad school. And this is all in California. So undergrad at Stanford and uh, my, my MA and PhD at UCLA. Wow. Yeah. And um, so I, I was lucky enough to be part of the generation, as you said in your intro, that um, found, found it once you know, we could embrace our identity and be out about who we were, uh, found that there, it was possible to, to really start exploring, studying, analyzing representations of gender and sexuality in, in literature and culture and cultural representations more broadly in a way that felt like we were doing a lot of discovery work and even a lot of sort of invention work um, uh, in that time. And we were already sort of, depending on, on the, the legacies of some, some folks who came before us who did some pioneering work, and I'm thinking about um, writers like Gloria Anzaldúa, Audre Lorde, uh, Gil Rubin, and others. 
Um, but I think in my generation in particular, um, we felt like we, we were more of a kind of a critical mass of people who were doing this across the country and really starting to kind of uh, set the stage for ways of studying uh, sexuality and gender that could certainly uh, uh, you know, transfer outside of literary and cultural study into the social sciences and even I think into, into the sciences. Um, so it's been quite a ride um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk more about it. It's amazing, like it's funny when you first started, Gina and I both like glanced at each other like, cause you basically just totally glossed over the fact that you went where you went to school. I mean, like that, that, that in itself is an accomplishment. I mean, th those are amazing things that to your point, these very humble beginnings to be a scholar at your level and to attend college where you went speaks a lot about you and about the audacity for someone like you to, to be, to, to attend those schools and to go off and do what you do. It's amazing. That's very inspiring. Well, Thank you. Yeah, Gina, do you want to say something? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> I only went to Maryland. And I, I went to University of Maryland, and I tell everybody all about it. And I just literally, your pedigree almost fell down. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to say a thing on this episode because I have clearly no idea what I'm talking about. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do Are you that. kidding? Uh, <laughs> I went to liberal arts college in Detroit for automotive design. I am totally out, uh, outnumbered here, but... Uh, <laughs> No, look, I fear the turtle. I, I love the University of Maryland. I have some great colleagues there. They have an excellent uh, Department of English. And I, I, th I that sounds like a really beautiful pedigree to me. So <laughs> just uh, let's start with that. Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's both audacity and, 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 and it's, it has to, it has to also sort of like happen with modesty at the same time, right? I think that, you know, growing up, immigrant working class. You know, I didn't speak a word of English when I was five years old when we first landed in Southern California. So you went to LA to learn Spanglish? I certainly <laughs> learned, I, I picked up my Spanglish in LA for sure. And you know, and it was a really interesting kind of Spanglish because it involved like Cuban Spanish at home, but mostly Mexican Spanish in, in my neighborhood. Wait, and in there's the world, a difference? And in the world that I grew up in, there's a, there's a nice difference, there's a rich difference. And you know, we learn a lot from one another when we speak to each other in our different forms of Spanish Absolutely. and Spanglish, right? Yeah. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm, I feel lucky that that was the experience I had growing up. Yeah. But no, I was just a really avid reader. I just loved having my face in a book. And that, I think, had everything to do with my success as a student. And, you know, and I was, I think, again, like lucky enough to be part of a generation of kids who came into this country at a moment when the, the, the sentiments around immigration were, I think, a little different. And, and we as Cubans uh, were lucky to find, a, I think, a more welcoming platform uh, when we got here than a lot of other immigrants even back then. So I count my lucky stars. I know that I'm, I, I both can take credit for some of my accomplishments, but I also know that it took much more than a village to get me to where I am today. It took, it took a whole country in a way. That's amazing. That's an amazing maybe, story. Maybe more it's than a very one country. Yeah. yeah, it's an inspiring story. Without a doubt, that's, uh, again, I applaud you for all of your efforts. So correct me if I'm wrong, please do. From our conversation we had earlier, you came out rather later in life, yes? Well, relatively speaking, I, I think that, um, you know, it, compared to, to the way that, that um, young people have the opportunity to know about, about their gay identity and their, you know, their, their LGBTQ identity in general um, these days, um, you know, my generation had nowhere near the kind of access to information and modeling and representation that's just so much more um, prevalent and, yeah. and accessible today, right? And so I, I do sort of count myself as having come out a little later and that I came out in my mid-20s, not my early 20s, that I came out in grad school and not in college. Um, even though, you know, I think I was starting to experiment and starting to, to sort of feel out um, what it would mean to be a gay man in the world when I was in college, um, that it wasn't until I was in graduate school and, you know, living in LA and going to UCLA and, and eventually moving to West Hollywood that I became a more public about my own identity, but then started to, to pursue it more as part of my scholar, scholarly interests and part of my, my research, uh, my research agenda. Absolutely. That, that it's, it, it was funny when you said West, West Hollywood, and I'm like, well, of course you came out in West Hollywood. <laughs> Well, I, I came out and, and then immediately moved to West Hollywood. Is how it went. If I, if I, I like, isn't that part of the prereq to live in West Hollywood? Yeah, if I would moved to West Hollywood before coming out, it really that, that would have been an interesting sort of way to do it. But uh, but no, it was more 
you know, sort of just coming to, to peace and acceptance and, and eventually, uh, you know, really uh, uh, pride and, and, and a sense of, of, of gratitude for, for the, 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 the opportunity I've, I've been given to have the, the life that I've had. Um, but, but no, it was, um, it took sort of having that kind of mental, emotional, sort of spiritual revolution in my own, in my own mind and heart happened first and then, and then pursue the life and then sort of like move, move to, move to the place where I could be myself and, um, and, and let that, and let that take shape. Awesome. It's, it's again, incredibly inspiring. Of course, we know that there are, um, Literature, it, you just go to Shakespeare or anything that's common that the you know as common folk will have read or know of to see um, <laughs> gay overtones or undertones, maybe if you will, within the literature. Can you tell us, speak to us a little bit about what you teach and your approach to literature in those classrooms? Sure. In those yeah. Lecture halls. Um, in particular, so um, I was hired at Georgetown in 1998 to teach U.S. Latinx literature and culture, right? And so that's usually my frame of reference. But you know, as you were saying, and as you know, we spoke before. If you go back to earliest time, to the earliest forms of human storytelling, right? I mean, I think one of the sort of core themes that's always run through it is the the sort of the difficulty and the challenge, but also like the pleasure and the sort of um, uh, the beauty that comes out of being embodied beings, right? And one of the ways that we experience ourselves as embodied beings in the, in the most profound way, right, is through our sexuality, through the way that we think of ourselves as having a gender or having a sense of like what our anatomy means to us and, th and to the world. Yeah. Before we start getting into, um, you know, really sort of basic foundational stories that, that are about love and about pleasure and about desire and about power and about the way that all of those... Um, uh, interact with one another and create the sort of the larger kind of rich complexity of our lives, right? And so by the time, you know, you get to anything more like a more contemporarily defined literary uh, tradition, right, or literary project, um, it's, you know, it's impossible not to notice that that sex is everywhere, right? And of course it should be because it's everywhere in our lives. It's er everywhere in, in the space of our humanity, in the space of animal life in general. And so, um, as you were saying earlier, I think that, um, you know, it was my generation that I think felt the, the real sort of meaningful shift from thinking that there were only sort of acceptable ways, acceptable ways of thinking about both sexuality and gender that were conventional and traditional and, and heteropatriarchal, cis heteropatriarchal, to beginning to see that actually, no, there was a much broader, richer array of possibility in thinking through again, like for me, uh, what starts with with our sort of our condition as embodied beings, right? And that you know what our bodies do to sort of carry us through our lives, what our bodies do to sort of you know to to make us needing you know uh, appetitive, desiring, pleasure seeking, but also loving uh, 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 people, right? And so, given any any tradition, this is going this should be probably a central focus of of representation and of themes and of, of exploration and of analysis. Um, and so that's as true of U.S. Latinx literature as it is of any other tradition, but it happens to be the one I'm, that I'm lucky enough to teach. And there's a good deal of work there and a good deal of work that was that already existed when I started doing my own sort of research by this point in the early 90s. Um, but that has definitely exploded. I mean, really proliferated in some really rich directions ever since. It's amazing. It's um, literature that I am personally not. I, I don't have enough knowledge background. I, I need to read more. Um, I think I'm I'm very guilty on many levels of that of not reading enough. I'd probably be smarter, obviously, Too if late. I maybe be more like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, great. That's a good. That's a that's a good um, um, stake in the ground for me. Is be more like Cardo. Um, <laughs> be more like Professor Ortiz. I, I don't know that I recommend that, but thank you. <laughs> um, for our listeners who would be much like myself, who would just starting to to look into this genre of li literature, where would one start? Is there a book that you would be like? Here's a good place to start. Uh, that's a really that's a really great question. I think that there are many places places where one could start, but I I, I think that in some ways um, there's uh, you know a really foundational influential book. Um, this is Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands La Frontera. That's from the late 1980s, and it's a it's mixed genre. It's it actually is sort of philosophy and theory, but also poetry and memoir. And uh, so Anzaldúa is a sort of queer woman sort of from the borderlands of Texas, 
uh, lesbian and with a certain inclination toward trans experience as well as a kind of um, what you would have called, I think, a mari macha, just kind of set out almost what I would call a, a kind of manifesto, but in, 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 the, in beautiful form. I mean, it's a really moving read. It's, it's one of those books that engrosses students and that really uh, sort of can transform um, in the way that she uh, translates and narrates her own sort of transformation of consciousness, right, of her mestiza consciousness, provides a model for other other young people, especially young readers, but I think any reader, right, um, who might be going through a certain, a similar kind of transformation in their own terms, in the way they think about themselves across all of these, uh, like, you know, categories of identity. So not just sexuality and gender, but also race, ethnicity, class, uh, migrant status. Absolutely transition is key in all parts of life. Yeah. And this is why we should have these conversations. Yes. Because it breaks down the barriers. We start seeing ourselves in each other. And I want to see more of myself in you because I want to be more <laughs> like you. Uh, but we start seeing ourselves in, other, in, in each other. And we yeah. start hearing the story and go, oh, that's my story. It's different. It's, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's, it's different, but it's the same. Yeah. And the more that we can have like that, my hope is the more barriers. I, the, it's what Gina and I set out to do with this with this series is really try to break down some of those barriers and see each other. Sure. See each other for who we are and that we're human and we have the same struggles. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And I think that- Our you know, similar struggles. I sure. Think. Yeah. No, I mean, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's, and again, it's it's not just Anzaldúa's text, but I think for me, it really is almost like a kind of exemplary um, moment in this in this thing that we're talking about where- um, the majority of her students who, who are going to her story aren't like her. And so in the, in, in, in the way that she's managed to tell a story in which they can either find themselves or find a path for themselves, um, I think is, is one of the extraordinary things about it. And again, you know, I, I sort of, I do want to um, make a claim for the way that literature does this in a particular way that's different. I, I think that there are ways that, that you can get this out of history, and I think that there are ways that you can get this even out of philosophy, but I think that literature is um, unique in its capacity for doing this, even if it's only because it's made up <laughs> and it's playful. But there's also what happens when you're just uh, encountering the work of a writer who's taken the time and the energy and followed the inspiration to, you know, it, it's one thing to say that like Ansaldu is mostly telling her own story, but she's doing it in a way that's extraordinarily creative. And it's through that creativity that she's bringing so many other readers into her world, but also giving them a chance to find a space for themselves in that world. And maybe to take some of, some of what she's doing into their own world. That process is something that I think is bigger than just when people are telling their own actual story. And this is why I think in some ways, literature has a kind of unique capacity. And when I say lit literature, I sort of mean the literary in general. I do mean creativity. I mean the imagination. I mean what happens when artists decide that rather than just narrate their lives, they're going to create other people and create other stories and try to engage their readers through a kind of shared act of imagination where, yes, it may be the writer who's kind of creating something initially, but when the reader gets to somebody else's work, they, they can't possibly know what the writer had in mind. They can only see the words on the page and from that have their own images, have their own sense of, of what that world would look like, right? Because the, the writer's not showing them a world, the writer's just giving them words, sharing a story and giving them the opportunity to actually then be a creator, a, a creator as well. So I, I love that. I think that that's a really powerful capacity that we have as the kind of human beings that we are. And, you know, perhaps that kind of practice also start, started in groups where people spoke the same language and where there was a sense of commonality and people told, told one another the same stories as a way of feeling like they had common experiences and a common set of qualities that made them into a community and, to, yeah, and connected them to one another. But what we know now and what we've known for a really long time is that it doesn't have to stay within groups, that this is something that actually can be translated out into a world that goes beyond what you're familiar with and where it's your language that's spoken to the rest of the world and to the, and to the rest of humanity. And that is, that is one of the sort of primary glues that binds us as a species and actually kind of also binds us to the world that we show each other when we tell, tell each other stories. It's not just about you and me as human beings, but it's 
how I see the world, how you see the world, how we can maybe see a world together that's bigger than us and about more than just our species, but about the home that we all share and the universe that we all that we all inhabit together. Imagine that thinking beyond ourselves. Yeah. Hey, Gina, I think it's time for you to be the creator and share your specialty and your talents. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, that sounds like a plan. So, so you know, we read a lot of notes um, on on you and uh, Ricardo, and I was kind of like inspired. And I thought about like what for me was like a very um, universal ingredient that's found all over the world and like olive oil and oil and like infusion and herbs is something that comes to mind for me. So uh, my tip today is infusing very good, the best olive oil you can afford um, or pistachio oil will work for this also if you don't like olive oil um, to make your garnish. So instead of doing a journey martini, we are making uh, infused olive oil and we're going to use thyme, garlic, salt, uh, and we're going to let it sit and a little bit of vinegar. Now you can use either red wine vinegar or white wine vinegar and we're going to make it, we're going to let it sit and then in um, our next episode we'll use it and then what you have is this just a beautiful infusion that we're going to float on top of our cocktail for a little bit of a sophisticate of a, of a very uh, classic martini. So... You can have things that are different and yet be very much the same. That's fantastic. Um, I have to say, obviously, olive oil is such a basic ingredient in so much Cuban cuisine that it's one of those things that just sort of makes me feel like I'm at home. And and for whatever reason, we we, we love vinegar, too. So. <laughs> it's fun. It's a good way to bring everything together. And I think that's the whole point, right, is like how you make togetherness happen. And, and all these things are so different, and then they work. <laughs> and they work. You know, and, and I think it's, it is that larger point about creativity. I, I love watching a mixologist uh, have that kind of pride in their work, right? And, and to have that kind of ingenuity. And uh, the drink is a story, right? And unto itself. And, and, it, <laughs> and once one has had one or two of them, maybe that'll lead to other stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as even, yeah, I was going to say, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure alcohol has played a very long, long history in storytelling. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's been documented a bit, too. I mean, so, just a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> I think writers should be a little bit more honest about what, what condition they're in where they're doing their best work. <laughs> I think it would make us all better people if that happened more often. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, not, it's not about the grammar. It's like getting solid meat out when you're yeah. like on the other on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, you, yeah. you really, you have to let the spirit move you, I think. <laughs> Oh, he's speaking I'll our language, through, Gina. Yeah. Wherever yeah. you can find it, yeah. <laughs> so, Gina, where are they going to go to get this um, tip, tricks? You're going to get your um, tips and tricks at designateddrinker.show. You can watch the tips, which I think is super fun, on our Instagram at designateddrinker.show. And at designated drinker on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, but it's really fun because you can see it, watch it, and, you know, while you're scrolling, learn something. So this brings us to the end of part one of our episode with Professor Ortez. And if you're anything like Gina and me, one round just ain't enough. So go top off that drink and get ready to check out part two of this episode as we continue our boozy banter about celebrating pride, diversity, and acceptance while Gina shares yet another pride-worthy Professor Ortez-inspired cocktail in part two. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.